Good afternoon, and welcome to the Jewish Policy Center webinar. I am Shoshana Bryan, Senior Director of the JPC and your host. We have a very large audience today. Uh, I know that many of you are here because you've heard and read today's guest, Dr. Stephen Bryan, possibly in our Insight Series or in In Focus Quarterly. Others are here because you want to know if we're related. Uh, yes, we are. Before we go to our program, here is your JPC commercial. The Jewish Policy Center was established in 1985 as a 501c3 organization, providing analysis of both foreign and domestic policies. That's policies, not politics. Our website is jewishpolicycenter.org. There you can read our Insight Series, our magazine In Focus, our blog In Context, <clears throat> see our pattern. You can also read Alliance Tracker, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> and Frontline Defense Blogs outside the pattern, but with lots of good information. We support a strong American defense capability, US-Israel security cooperation, and missile defense. We support the legitimacy and security of Israel against anyone who would deny them. As an organization that sits slightly to the right of center, the JPC advocates for small government, low taxes, free trade, fiscal responsibility, energy security, and free speech and intellectual diversity that last one being really important. In this series of talks, we've been pleased to bring you scholars and policymakers on a variety of issues, including China, Israel, Iran sanctions, uh, and a side trip to the Supreme Court. Many of you were on the call a few months ago with Harold Rode, who talked about the history of the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan and why certain conflicts go on for centuries. Today, we're going to talk more about a limited but no less important aspect of 21st century conflict, technology, and specifically how unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, can change the battlefield. Israel is the leader in UAV technology. I saw it in Israel for the first time in 1982, right before, right as it was being rolled out. And Israeli technology appeared on the battleground between Armenia and Azerbaijan this summer. Our speaker is Dr. Stephen Bryan, who was the founder and first director of the Defense Technology Security Agency during the Reagan administration, where he was also Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Trade Security Policy. Prior to that, he was Senior Staff Director of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Executive Director of a grassroots political organization, because it was political, we won't name it, and Director of the Jewish Institute for National Security Affairs, JINSA. In his post-government career, he's been the president of Finn Mechanic uh, North America, and a commissioner on the US-China uh, Security Review Commission. Maybe we'll get him to come and talk about China. He's written for a great many publications, including Asia Times, The Washington Times, Newsweek, American Thinker, Epic Times, and here for the JPC, which is an excuse to tell you if you want to see his writing, jewishpolicycenter.org. He has published six books on technology, and security subjects, including technology, security, and national power, and security for holy places. Now your public service announcement. You are muted, but you knew that. If you have a question, you can send it to us during the program using the Q&A function on your Zoom screen. No more emails to info at Jewish Policy Center anymore, just the Q&A function on Zoom. We will monitor it during the program. And now I'm very happy to say Steve, the floor is yours. Thank you, Shoshana. Uh, today I'm gonna to discuss with you, and by the way, thanks to the Jewish Policy Center for inviting me to give this talk. Today I'm gonna to talk to you about UAVs and modern warfare, and I'm going to focus on just what happened in Nagorno-Karabakh in the Armenian-Azerbaijani war that took place in the last few months. Uh, and I'm gonna use a PowerPoint to help me along this is a disease I acquired in the Pentagon. So you'll have to forgive me if I rely on it. You're going to see it on your screen. If you're connected by telephone and not by uh, uh, computer, uh, you should still be able to follow along without any trouble. So with that, with that said, I'm going to put it on share screen and see what happens. Here we go. And... Uh, by the way, the picture you see, the, that thing launching to the left of the screen, is the uh, Harrop 
a loitering munition. It's a type of UAV and we'll talk more about it as we proceed. Can't flick, there we go. Uh, this is the, where the, the actual conflict occurred. To the left, you see Armenia, which has borders with Iran, Turkey, and Georgia. Uh, to the right, you see Azerbaijan, which also has a border with Iran and a border with Russia as well as Georgia. Uh, and if you look down in the left-hand corner, there's a little blue area called Nakhchivan, which is actually part of Azerbaijan, but it was disconnected from Azerbaijan physically. And it has a border with Turkey and with the little one and, and with Iran. All the fighting occurred in that center section, and that is Nagorno-Karabakh. The star, the green star, and the name Stepkana, Stepanakert is the capital or so-called capital of Nagorno-Karabakh. And much of the fighting took place in and around these areas, especially Lachin, which is a corridor, a critical corridor that leads into the heart of Nagorno-Karabakh. So that's just the war in a nutshell. Now, this is what happened in the war to the Armenians. By the way, just so you know, there were around 2,800 casualties, that means dead, uh, on the uh, Azerbaijani side. The Armenians have never given us any solid figures, but it's in the neighborhood of four to 5,000 killed, which is a very pretty high number for this kind of war. Now, Azerba uh, Armenia lost almost everything it owned in this conflict. It was a quite devastating. They lost 250 tanks and armored per uh, personnel carriers. They lost 270 artillery and multiple uh, launch rocket systems. They lost 150 military vehicles of all kinds, mainly uh, trucks, but other vehicles too. They lost 60 air defense systems. They lost 11 command and control centers. Eight armories were destroyed and one complete S-300 and a number of other S-300 launchers. S-300 is the famous uh, ballistic missile defense system that the Russians built. Most of the Armenian equipment was Russian, almost everything. And most of the Azerbaijani equipment was Russian with the exception of the UAVs. So let's take a look closer. The biggest thing that emerged from this war is that almost all the air defenses that the Russians had supplied to Armenia were wiped out. And almost all of them were wiped out by UAVs of different kinds. We'll talk more about what they are in a little bit. This is the S-300 system that I mentioned. You can see these deployed in Syria, they're in Iran, uh, they're in Turkey uh, and other places. This is the TOR, short range uh, air defense system the Russians supplied to Armenia. This is the ASA SAM air defense system, it's an older one, but it's quite effective. And uh, these were the ones that were all knocked out. Now. This is a, a photo of a UAV in the picture. By the way, that's President Aliyev, for the president of Azerbaijan. And he's standing next to a, an Israeli UAV called the Hermes 900. The Hermes 450 and the Hermes 900, both of these are, are essentially uh, surveillance UAVs, very sophisticated sensors. They can stay in the air for a very long time. And they were uh, in the hands of the Azerbaijanis the Armenians had no equivalent. So these are surveillance UAVs in this conflict. The attack UAVs, the, the main ones were, first of all, the, the Bayraktar TB2, which is made by Turkey. You can see a photo of it. It carries four missiles. Uh, it's got a unique tail design. You notice it's a V-shaped tail. And it's a very big UAV, actually, although it sits very low to the ground. The wingspan of 12 meters is actually greater than the wingspan of an F-16 fighter jet. The interesting thing is that, that this particular UAV, which costs about $5 million, uh, was successful in this conflict. The Armenians couldn't knock them out for the most part. They did shoot down some, but very few compared to the amount of damage done. These cost about $5 million a piece. They could stay in the air 24 hours. And while they have a long range, their communication range is much more limited. Uh, in the center of the fuselage of the, of the aircraft, if you can see it here, you'll see a ball. And that ball is, is where the cameras and sensors and lasers are. 
And that's made by a US company, a US Canadian company, L3. Uh, a number of the components of this UAV, like the engines made in Austria, come from elsewhere. But the, the Turks did a very good job in putting this machine together. It was very successful. Now, three UAVs came from Israel, and these are called loitering munitions. Sometimes they're called kamikaze UAVs. That's because these devices hover over a target and then shoot down and, and crash into the target. They are one, a one-time show. They don't, they, they're, you just destroy themselves and the target. The most famous of these is called Harrop. Now, you may know the name Harpy, and you may have heard the name Harpy because it was quite a controversy some years ago between Israel and United States over the Harpy, which was the predecessor of the Harrop. Uh, and this particular UAV was sold to China, and that's where the difficulty came from. There were no limits on those sales, either by Israel or by the U.S. at the time, but the U.S. got upset about it. And so that's where a, a bit of difficulty took place. The Harrop is, is the follow-on, or sometimes called Har Harpy 2. It is a essentially a machine that, that is designed to go after radars, any kind of radar. And it, essentially its job is to suppress enemy air defenses. They call that SEAD, suppression of enemy air defenses. It was hugely effective in the Azerbaijan-Armenian war. Skystriker is another one, it's much smaller, it's electric powered, and Orbiter, yet another one. And these are more discrete, smaller weapons compared to Har Harp contains a pretty large warhead of about 70 kilograms. So it's good size. It's more than capable of destroying an S-300, for example, and knocking it out. And it has been used by the Israelis, not, not just uh, by the Azerbaijanis. It's been used by the Israelis. By the way, it's also been used by the Turks. So they, they all have the same weapon that were supplied by Israel. Now, the Harrop, uh, as you can see, it has a, a, a pretty good range. It can stay in the air about eight hours. Um, it either can work as a man in the loop. By that, we mean, man in the loop means a man in a control center somewhere else on the ground controls the UAV remotely through a radio connection. Or it can operate autonomously. So if you launch it to where a, a SAM system, is, a, an air defense system is located or a radar is located and you let it orbit until it sees it, it will take care of itself. It, it doesn't need to communicate with its home base and knock out that, that system. Uh, now, let's see here. There's some things to take into consideration and, and, and to understand about. First of all, this, this war in Nagorno-Karabakh is the first time that on a massive basis, UAVs, including suicide drones, were used. The two most effective in the, in the conflict were obviously the Bayraktar, the, the Turkish one. Uh, but there's an interesting story behind that. And also uh, the Harup, which was very effective against the strategic, strategic defense systems that uh, were in the hands of the uh, uh, Armenians. Now, the important thing about the Turkish drone, the Bayraktar, from everything we have seen and what we can guess, because we don't know all the details yet. But what it looks like is that the Turkish drones were wa working in combination with, with the Israeli Hermes 900s and 450s to, to identify targets and then uh, to direct the, the Bayraktars toward those targets to take them out. The second interesting thing is the fact that, that the the Armenians never knew what hit them in most cases. They provided very little in the way of uh, uh, response to these sorts of attacks. And in the films, you can see that very clearly because you will see people that will hear the, the thing coming in at the last minute and running away, but there's no attempt to shoot them down. They, they were caught very often by surprise. And so the destruction was quite great. So the first big lesson of this war is that precision weapons and the form of UAVs and suicide drones, if you will, really do matter. 
they can take out an awful lot of the enemy's equipment. I mean, things like tanks, which were fairly much invulnerable until UAVs came along or until aircraft went after them, now can be knocked out with very little collateral damage and, and very little cost. I mean, uh, the cost of a UAV is, is fairly small compared to the cost of the targets. And, and that's why the Armenians lost tanks, they lost vehicles, they lost artillery, they lost rocket launchers, they lost their air defenses. And they lost a lot of soldiers who were killed by these things too. <clears throat> the other thing to notice about this war is that air power played almost no role in the fighting. Neither side had very many aircraft to begin with, about a dozen on each side. Most of them were old Sukhoi 25s. Four Sukhois were shot down early in the war uh, by, by uh, the Azerbaijanis, probably also by Turkish F-16s. That's not clear, but at least in two cases, it's fairly certain that Turkish F-16s knocked out the Sukhois flown by the Armenians. And after that, there were no more airplanes. Nobody wanted to put them up. They were afraid they were going to get knocked out. So that was the end of it. That's a lesson for the future for all air forces because air forces have always resisted uh, taking on UAVs as frontline players in conflict. They always want to have fighter planes and pilots in front. But the truth of the matter is that the, what we've seen in, our, in, in, in this latest war shows us that maybe the game has changed quite a lot. We have to be aware of it. Loitering munitions and, and, and some unique tactics uh, destroyed virtually all the Russian supplied air defenses. That's, that's quite a, a thing, I mean, that's quite remarkable. Now the Israelis have been using it against Syrian air defenses for some time. Uh, they, they've also, the Turks have also used it against uh, air defenses in Libya. So it's not just in Azerbaijan and Armenia, but the scale of it in Azerbaijan and Armenia is quite considerable. Now we come to the last and very interesting point. The performance of the Russian radars and the Russian air defenses in this conflict was really poor. And the debate is raging as to why that happened. The basic uh, elements of the debate were three. Were the radars really bad? Were the operators really bad? Which is another serious consideration. Or were the designs of the, of the UAV such that they were very hard to hit. We know, for example, that the Harab is very difficult to see on radar. It's designed that way, it's stealthy. We didn't know, but it seems that the Bayraktar has some stealthy character to it as well, which made it very hard to hit. And those little electric ones, they, they, they are not gonna be knocked out by conventional air defenses. You need other kinds of systems to deal with them. But having said that, I think the Russians really have to give some serious thought to the, what the future of the air defenses for them uh, is and how to design them correctly and what to do it. For example, and I'll just mention this as the last point, one of the systems that was, that was knocked out uh, in, the, in, the, in the war was a very sophisticated um, electronic warfare system the Russians supplied to the Armenians. And it was knocked out by a harrop. And that's not supposed to happen. It's supposed to be the, the electronic defense systems to, supposed to knock out the harrop, not the other way around. So, and this is something the Israelis have gotten to be very good at, I might add, is dealing with the intense electronic warfare environments where the enemy will have uh, countermeasures against uh, their, their systems, anti-drone systems, anti-radar system, all of that. So I think we can say that, that the, the, and by the way, in, in terms of the pioneering of, uh, by the Israelis in terms of air, air defenses, there's, there's no, um, in terms of uh, UAVs and loitering munitions, there's no doubt about that. Uh, starting in really in the late seventies and all the way up to today. The, the US, uh, got its start in, in air, in the UAVs from Israel. The, pre, the Predator, which you've probably heard a lot about the US UAV, was designed by a named, man named Abraham Karam, he's still around, uh, uh, for 
the U.S. Uh, originally it was called Amber. Very successful surveillance and attack uh, UAV. Uh, and then this, the ones that followed come from that same lineage. Uh, in terms of uh, more tactical UAVs, the U.S. Navy bought its first UAV in the early 1980s uh, from Israel. Uh, and, and that was, uh, was a, a system called uh, Pioneer. And it was a combination of both the Israeli IAI scout and Elbit's uh, Mastiff that were pushed together in the US then called Pioneer and put on naval ships and used in the first Iraq war, very successfully, I might add. So uh, sometimes you can invent something that's too good <laughs> because it spreads and everybody has them. The Iranians have them, the, the Russians now have them, the uh, Syrians have them, everybody has them. So we're entering the next generation of UAV warfare, but it's here to stay. And I think it's a, it was a very impressive what we saw in the last few months, September, October, November, and into the beginning of December uh, in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. There, there's never been anything quite like it. So I'll, I'll stop there and uh, take questions. Thank you. Um, that was an extraordinary picture of something that has very, very far reaching implications. We have some questions from our listeners and we have some questions that were sent in before. Uh, question from a listener, what are the primary defensive weapons for shooting down UAVs and has Israel counterbalanced itself looking for the answers to UAVs while it builds better UAVs? Well, Israel already has a lot of systems to counter UAVs, um, probably a dozen. The U.S. has a number, but mostly they're not deployed yet. There, there, there are two basic ways to go after a UAV. The, the, the first way is to try and jam its communications. There are two kinds of communications, data links from the actual UAV back to the command center and a GPS, because they all use GPS for their guidance. So if you can jam them, you can make the UAV crazy and it'll just crash, if you can. It's not always clear that you can. And of course, there are countermeasures to that. So that's one way. And the second way is to try and knock them out. And to knock them out, you can use a gun. You can use a laser. Uh, you can even catch them in nets. There, there are a whole kind of solutions. The main point, is you can also try and fool them. So the, there are all these things that exist. And right now, everybody is rushing around. I think after Nagorno-Karabakh, everybody realizes that they have to have defenses against UAVs, that they're, they're a real threat and that they can cause you massive damage. So here's a question from a listener who says, I'm concerned about the sale of this technology to China. First of all, what is known today about China's ability to have to build to use UAVs? Um, and secondly, how good are they? The ones that China builds? And this leads to another question by a listener, so we'll put them together. How good are Russian, Chinese, and Iranian drones as compared to those of the Western systems? Oh, that's a lot of questions. I know it's a lot of questions, but we have time. It's okay. It's fine. <laughs> let's, let's start with the China question. Uh, the Chinese build a full range of all kinds of UAVs. They have everything. Uh, the one we see most of is called Wing Loon. Wing Loon 2 is the latest one. And, and, and these are being used in the Middle East. In fact, the, the UAE has bought quite a number of them and they supplied them to the anti-government Libyan forces where they've been used. Uh, and, and they work to a certain extent. Uh, it's a bit like the Predator. And I believe it's a copy of the Predator. I, I think that the Chinese stole the plan plans and copied it and it works and they sell at about a third of the price of the predator 
and we don't really sell the predators. So, so the, the, the point is that they have, they have tactical UAVs as well. They have loitering munitions. So they have everything that we're talking about. And they have good manufacturing. I mean, look, China can make anything. They make the, can make the, uh, the optics. They can make the uh, lasers. They can make uh, just about any component of uh, the motors because motors are big issues for UAVs. Most of the motors in the Israeli UAVs and the Turkish UAVs don't come from Israel or Turkey. They mainly come from Europe. Uh, but the Chinese have copies of all those. So they, they can do all that. So I would say as far as China is concerned, there are next generation technologies that are going into UAVs that Chinese may not have. But so far as, can, let's say what we saw in, what we saw in the Armenian Azerbaijani war, the Chinese have equivalent equipment and, and they can operate it. So we have to consider that a threat. Now, the, the Iranians have UAVs, uh, increasingly good ones. They cooperate with China. They cooperate with North Korea who also have UAVs. Um, they cooperate with Russia who also have UAVs. So uh, they have, uh, I would say, one generation plus type equipment, pretty good equipment. I think they're weak on the surveillance side. I think they're, they're better on the arm side because it takes less sophistication. The Russians uh, are behind in UAVs. They're, they're now beginning, they have about a dozen models, different kinds, including loitering munitions, but they've been slow to introduce them and they lack money. Uh, so, and I think they have resistance in their own forces because I think basically the same as the US forces for a very long time didn't want them. The Russians don't want them either because it's not stylish. You need, they want something big and bankful and, and UAVs are small and not very bankful. So, you know, that kind of thing. More, more local politics than anything else. But now they have some pretty good ones, um, but they haven't been tested. We have not seen them in any, in any conflict. We, we've seen the Iranian ones. The Houthis have them, uh, and they fired plenty of them at Saudi Arabia and UAE. So we've seen them in action. Uh, they've just got a new model that the Iranians supplied, which, will, which is a loitering munition. So I imagine in the next months or so, we'll see those in action. So we'll get to see them to some extent. Um, the, Iranian, the Iranians themselves have not directly used their UAVs in any warfare. They supply them to their surrogates, their proxies. Did I, did I cover the, the question? You did, thank you. Um, I'm gonna run some questions together here. <clears throat> A Navy stealth drone crashed in Iran some time ago. The listener asks, did Iran effectively copy US technology from that drone? And there are two questions here about the attack on the Saudi oil fields. And the question is raised as to whether there was drone technology involved in those attacks. The second one, can you repeat that for me? Right, the attack on the Saudi oil fields. Oh, yes. Were there drones involved in that attack? Oh, yes. So if you would talk about that. All right, backwards. Uh, in, in the Saudi oil field, two, two facilities were attacked. Uh, and, the, and this was by the Iranians, although they, they, they deny it. And the, Hout, the, the Houthis took credit for it, but the, the, the cruise missiles and the, and the drones came from the north, not from the south, so they couldn't have been Houthi. Uh, the only argument is whether they came from Iraqi territory or whether they came from uh, Iranian territory, but they come together, so it's hard to say for sure. The, they used both cruise missiles uh, and uh, drones the, uh, against these targets. Uh, the drones are kind of a delta-shaped drones. They were used to crash into those big oil tanks that you've seen in pictures with holes in them. They hit them very accurately. Uh, in fact, that was the most impressive part of that exercise from a military point of view was the accuracy because they were beyond any known data links. That means it was when they actually struck those targets, there was no man in the loop, okay? 
And, and, and that meant they had to operate autonomously and actually hit the targets, which means they probably had some kind of scene matching software and computers inside uh, those drones. Uh, how that worked, they've been recovered, parts of those have been recovered, but no one has revealed and probably classified uh, what they really had. But my friend Uzi Rubin in, in Israel thinks that they had something like scene matching capabilities, uh, precision attack capabilities without communication links. Now that, there's a counter argument to that is that they could have had satellite links. That's a possibility too. So they were sophisticated. There's no doubt about it. And the first question was. <laughs> I shouldn't run them together. The I have a first, short memory. I have a, I'm getting old, short term memory. The, the first part of that question was, uh, there was an American Navy drone that crashed in Iran at one point. Yes. Did the Iranians effectively copy the US technology? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a very important operation that took place. It wasn't just Iranians. Uh, I, I believe it was the Russians and the Iranians who worked together to fool that drone to essentially intercept the data link and give instructions to the drone to land on an Iranian runway, uh, which it did. Uh, badly, it crashed its wing and uh, bad pilots. Uh, good idea, bad pilots. But anyway, they landed it. Um, they put it on display with some masking tape to hold it together. Um, and they copied it. They have a what looks just like it flying around, but it isn't. I mean, I, I can't believe they have the capability to do those kinds of sensors that were in that device. Um, and I don't think the Russians can either. But they got a lot of ideas out of it. They learned a lot. And we learned something, which we should have learned a long time ago, which is not to use unencrypted data links that your enemy can intercept, because then they can grab your drones and steal them, which is what they did. So did, did we make the appropriate adjustment on that? Did we not do that anymore? You have to ask the Pentagon. They would know. But I mean, it was clear that if they didn't, then more of them would be sitting on Iranian airfields. Okay, so you mentioned that uh, Israel was able to just, uh, Israel, Azerbaijan was able to disable the Russian S-300 air defense system with UAVs. Right. Yes. A couple of questioners ask, any idea how it will do against the S-400? Well, it hasn't been tried. So, you know, we're not, it's all speculation. Uh, I think the S-400 is vulnerable. It's, I think it's vulnerable to jamming. And I think it's vulnerable to any radiation weapons, which the Harrop is. Uh, there's only one of them in, in the Middle East today, and that's the one, well, actually, I should say Turkey has one, uh, more than one, they have two, and there's one in Syria, which is guarding the Khmein Min uh, airfield where the Russian, Russians have their base. It's not in Syrian hands. Syrians have the S-300, but I believe that the S-400 is vulnerable. Questioner asks, the F-35 fighter jet that the United States has spent a lot of money on uh, and which Israel has purchased for a lot of money. Are, are planes going to be made obsolete by the kind of warfare that you can have with UAVs or will we still need airplanes, jet fighters, pilots, so on? Well, there's a bunch of answers to that question. I mean, one is you want air superiority. You want to control the skies. So you, uh, you need aircraft for that. You can't control the skies with UAVs. Not today. In future, who knows? But right now, no. Uh, secondly, to take out big targets, UAVs aren't going to do the job. They, they carry very small munitions, I mean, very light munitions. And even though they can be precision, they're not going to knock out a well-fortified installation. So you need aircraft bombers and fighter bombers for that purpose. Uh, so I don't think the airplane is going to go away anytime soon. Uh, but they are talking about heavier UAVs or uh, mixed mode, you know, where you could have an F-35 flying along a fighter jet that's not manned. Okay. 
and you can send the fighter jet that's not manned in first because you can use a much cheaper fighter jet for that purpose than an expensive F-35. So the Wait, wait, wait. You said an unmanned jet fighter. I did. Do we have those? Or is that something that people go to bed at night and they think about those? Oh, I, I believe we have some in, in the evaluation or in you know, development, but we don't have any in the force. In other words, that they're not deployed at the present time. Um, th there's a lot of resistance to that. And, you know, as you can imagine, politically in the Air Force to having such a thing. But it could be really effective. And even ground attack aircraft could be very effective. You don't necessarily have to have the pilot in the cockpit. So the, the, the technology today is extremely good and real time or almost near real time. So the, the, the technology is here. It's a decision to, to, to make the weapons and use it. Uh, you know, the, the, the compelling thing for right now, the F-35 is the frontline tactical defense system of the United States. It's not strategic. The F-22 is more strategic. It carries a much bigger load of bombs and it's also full stealth. The F-35 is partial stealth. Uh, so, you know, we have, we have a pretty good arsenal and we have the stealth bomber, the B-2, and we have a new one coming along uh, that will be a stealth bomber as well. So we'll have a lot of firepower, which we'll need if we get into a major conflict. So if you were thinking about taking out Iranian assets or bases or facilities, you, need an you would still want an airplane. I want a big airplane. <laughs> I, I look, you're, most of the, the serious stuff on the Iranian side is dug in, in tunnels and caves, stuff like that, which means bunker buster bombs. These weigh 2,000 pounds or more. Those are big. Uh, you're not going to carry, even on a fighter jet, you're not really going to carry those. You're going to need a B-1 or a B-2 bomber or the new bomber coming along, or B-52. But B-52 really can't do it because it can't penetrate air defenses. It has to use glide bombs or um, standoff weapons today. It's not going to get near Iran. It can't. It, has to, it can fly out in the middle of the Persian Gulf. That's about it. So I think uh, stealthy bombers are going to be very important for conventional and non-conventional defense. Thank you. So we are aware that Hezbollah in Lebanon has UAVs. Okay. They have actually flown them over Israel. Israel has destroyed them, at least one or two of them. I don't know what technology they used against them. Um, where do they get them? Would they be Iranian drones? Uh, they either are Iranian drones or they're buying Chinese uh, uh, commercial drones and, and strapping weapons to the bottom. Uh, the ones that, the, that attacked, the, there were 12 or more uh, UAVs that attacked the Russia's base in Syria. Uh, they were homemade platforms with Chinese engines, balsa wood and saran wrap, uh, stuff like that. And they had a really neat little rack on the bottom that the locally was designed by these Hezbollah guys. And they hung uh, RPG warheads on them. And essentially they crashed them into, they weren't coming back. They crashed them into the airfield and, and they actually destroyed some airplanes. Uh, pissed off the Russians. I know that's not a technical term that's usually acceptable, but but uh, the, the Russians were very angry about it, very angry. Partly because they didn't have anything to shoot it down with. Uh, now they do. Now they've brought in some stuff. But, uh, and they claim they do. I don't say that they've done it. But they claim they have. And I, I believe them. But it was a problem. Now, uh, Israel has been penetrated a, a number of times by um, UAVs, Hezbollah, mostly surveillance UAVs. Uh, trying to target, you know, see what the best targets are and how, where they are and stuff like that. And they've knocked out a few. Some of them were shot down by airplanes or helicopters. helicopters. And some of them may be other ways they don't talk about. So as you look at the requirements for American defense, defense of Americans deployed abroad, 
or if you're Israel, which is a small country surrounded by other people, what is it that makes you most nervous looking at the capabilities that have been deployed in Armenia and Azerbaijan? Well, a bunch of things. First, first of all, that's a good question. First of all, for any of our deployed units around the globe, no matter where they are, they're exposed to UAV attacks today, period. Has to be accepted. That's what they're exposed to. And they have rather poor defenses right now. And I know the Army is working very hard on a new integrated defense system that's supposed to take care of the problem. We, let's wait and see if it does. But, you know, the Iron Dome is a system that could help them a lot with this kind of point defense. Uh, but they only have two and they're going to test them and it's going to take forever. I just put them where they need them and buy enough of them and be done with it until we have something better. That's just me talking, of course, not the army. Uh, so that's one level of concern is the exposure of our forces in different countries to these kinds of attacks. And you can't rule it out in Iraq. You can't rule it out in Afghanistan. You can't rule it out in uh, Oman or in uh, UAE or Saudi, where we have some forces. They're all exposed. You know, it'll be some terrorist that launches them, but so what? I mean, they are Iranian, right? Or Chinese or somebody else that wants to cause us trouble. Now, in the bigger picture, if you think about one, uh, Predator, which is intercontinental in range, okay? You can fly it from Kansas to Afghanistan. So can the Chinese. They can fly it from Beijing to Washington, D.C., so if, if somebody wants to cause us trouble, that is something we have no domestic defenses against today at all, period. We have nothing. So I think looking ahead, we have to prepare ourselves to be able to counter that kind of threat, which means better radar coverage of our own country, which we don't have, not just for ballistic missiles, which we also don't have really, except on the West Coast, we have nothing on the East Coast, okay? Uh, we have nothing in the South. I mean, something could come up. Venezuela could launch something. I mean, you can't rule any of this stuff out. That terrorism of different kinds could be launched with UAVs, long-range ones. And we're not, we're not equipped at all to defend ourselves. So one of the things, you know, why we're spending trillions or whatever we spend on billions on defense we might think about defending our own country. And that, that I think is something that we've neglected. You know, we've been isolated from the rest of the world and happily so, I think. Those days are over. If a cheap UAV, by the way, uh, you know, something like a, a, a Bar Baraktar costs 5 million, a Wing Loon probably costs 10. That's cheap for a terrorist group. They, that's chump change. They can get them and use them. And they may not want to you know, do anything but cause us trouble. Drop one of them into the Pentagon. Drop one of them into the White House. Drop one of them into the Capitol. They tried before. We're not immune to this. They, they try to use American airplanes, uh, you know, commercial airlines, you know, 9-11, to crash into those same targets. Now they have a new tool. They don't have to waste anybody's life. You know, they can do it and they can cause a, a lot of grief. But I think we have to prepare for that. And we have to prepare both for tactical and for what we call CONUS, Continental United States Defense. We have neglected it, it needs to be fixed soon. So people who listen often know that my goal is to end each call with a positive note. So I ask the question. <laughs> I was trying to think what that is. <laughs> yeah, you're trying to think of what I'm going to ask you that's positive. Um, I don't have one. Okay. This is a very interesting program because it raises all kinds of possibilities that have not been dealt with, that need to be dealt with, and it leads to larger issues of U.S. defense and Israeli defense. So there's not any really happy question for you. I will simply point out that one of our listeners wrote in to say that it's nice to see that you and I are socially distanced, but still in the same room. That's as close to positive as we get. I so my, I have my mask. And he has his mask. Uh, we're hermits together. We are hermits together. As we draw this program to a close, let me say to you listeners, um, 
We are going to be off for the next two weeks. Next week is Martin Luther King holiday, short week. The week after is uh, Inauguration Day. The week after that, however, we come back with Tevi Troy, presidential historian extraordinaire. He is going to talk about uh, American administrations and Israel. And I promise you a great program, maybe not as good as today's program, I'm not sure, but a great program um, where I know we can end on a positive note. So let me thank Steve for making the long trek to our studio to join us today. And thank you all for listening. Watch your mailbox. We will give you time and date on Tevi Troy. Have a good day.